Hi, I'm Shannon. If you're new to the channel, I'm a Canadian medical student. Every Wednesday, I release short videos with interviews with different medical students, such as today, advice for pre-meds or new medical students, day in the life vlogs. Subscribe to not miss the variety of amazing medical students that I will be talking about. So today, I'm super happy to be introducing my classmate, Brandon. Um, Brandon and I are in the same small group together, so we know each other quite well. Brandon has an interest in pathology and alongside medicine is pursuing a semi-professional career in classical music composition. I thought this was really unique and he will have a lot of interesting things to share. So Brandon, do you want to take us away to your journey um, to how you ended up in medicine, how you ended up pursuing music? My path into medical school uh, was quite different from maybe typical path. I, I lead two lives in a sense. So I, I finished high school with sort of the idea that I wanted to do um, something musical. But in addition, I really liked the sciences in high school. And uh, um, the other thing is, is, is that there is medicine in my, in my family and healthcare in my family. My mom's a pharmacist and my dad's a family doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the seeds for that were kind of planted pretty early on. Um, and later, uh, towards my, at the end of high school, um, I realized that, you know, I wouldn't really be happy, I think, doing either or, and I had to find something that was sort of creative for me to work with um, in the arts, as well as, as something in the sciences that was most likely going to be medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I started my undergrad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very lucky that, that the university that I went to for my undergrad um, allowed me to, to do a dual degree in both music related work and also um, also molecular biology. And so I found mentors in, in the departments that kind of steered me on, on the path to, to do both. Your choice to do a dual degree with music mm -hmm. and biology, is that common? Is that something that was only found at your undergrad or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. It's becoming a lot more common now as people, uh, as university systems are becoming more flexible and allowing people to um, combine sometimes very disparate interests. And I think that's a really great thing. Still a lot of paperwork involved and there was a lot of, you know, communication between the departments and, and I had to do a lot of planning to make sure I'd graduate on time and these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so the short answer is it's probably not normal mm -hmm. uh, or typical, but it's not you know, it, it's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. So I guess what the takeaway from that is if someone is interested in something, realize that they can take the initiative to create a custom major, but it's going to be a lot of work. And just to 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly. And, and, you know, a bit of extra paperwork and, you know, how much work it is kind of depends on what your, what your major is um, and mm -hmm. what the combination is. And if there's any overlap between the two things that you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I think absolutely. You only get to do kind of the undergraduates at university once um, mm -hmm. if you're very fortunate. And uh, so I tried to make the most of it. Time doing two undergrads. What was tricky about that is in the sense that in music, um, there's many different commitments that are outside of normal class time. And so they kind of start you off right away. So, for instance, um, a typical music student performs at least four times a year, either in ensembles or in by themselves. Um, uh, they take classes like any other university student, uh, but that's only a part of what they have to do. Mm -hmm. um, in science, at least at the undergraduate level, it's a lot more cut and dried. You show up to class, you write your exams, you know, and you want, if you want to take on research and extra projects, you can, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. and, and in the fine arts, it's often required that you kind of live part of what you're doing too. So there's many commitments outside of the usual schedule. Sometimes there's late nights. But for me, you know, I think I, I met enough interesting people in music and found out, out enough interesting things, both in music and science, that it really propelled me forward, even if it meant that, you know, I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't sleeping as much as I maybe should have. The big scary thing at that time was for pre-medical students in undergrad is often really curtailed by the stringent requirements in terms of GPA that many medical schools have now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a very difficult thing because basically you sort of have to um, you you have to expand yourself and take risks, but not take too many risks. Um, 
And that was, that was very much a challenge for me, I think, in, in undergrad, the concern that I would hyperextend myself one way and that would potentially um, affect my, my later ambitions for medicine. Other than that, I think, you know, choosing what you, what you like to do in terms of your specialty in medicine, sorry, in medicine, we're not there yet, in, uh, in, in your undergrad uh, is, is really good. And the other thing is, is that it's time well spent and you learn things you like doing and uh, a lot of the time you don't get the opportunity to do that out of undergrad. Something people gave me advice for, but I, that I didn't listen to and now I wish I did a little bit more. Right. Is said, take the classes that you can't take in, um, in medical school. So I was like, I was asking them, do I, should I take more pathology, more anatomy, more, you know, this, this, and this. And they're like, no, no, no that will happen. Don't worry about it. I didn't listen and I ended up bloating a lot of that. And I remember thinking there was, so I have an interest in writing outside of medicine. I wish there was like some creative writing classes I looked at. And then one was, I thought they weren't going to help me in medicine. And then two, that very realistic concern about GPA, because these classes, I don't think people should never look down on these because these can be very hard, any artistic classes, because it's hard to give you, you know, a hundred out of a hundred or even yeah. like 95 because it's very, there's a lot of subjectivity to that. So that's mm. a very cautious thing to do with grades. But I think if there was a way around it, maybe I took it pass fail or, um, you know, maybe be more careful on these. I think it would have been fun to just inject some of that into the undergrad students. So I think yeah, it's absolutely. Cool. yeah. And you know, the other neat thing about these sorts of courses is, um, uh, and I think something that's miscommunicated a lot of the time about fine arts education in universities is a lot of the time these courses are sort of, uh, you get to choose how hard you make them for yourself because a lot of the time they assess you, not necessarily on meeting a certain standard, but how much you or your instructor feels you improved during the time you took the class. Um, so if, if you have no experience in writing, for instance, um, which is absolutely not your situation. I think you've done actually quite a bit of writing. Um, but if you, if you have no experience in writing and you take risks and you, um, and you try new things and you improve and you grow yourself, then I think the majority of, of fine arts instructors appreciate that. So that's very interesting because that's kind of the opposite of our science classes. I mean, there's no, it's not like they don't encourage it. I think they do try to, but there's no room or active assignments for you to do that so that's yeah. interesting so would you say that your, that would be your tip to do well in those classes to to take risks and show off innovation and trying it, yeah it, it's tough because it depends on your instructor and it depends on kind of what you want out of the class and what their agenda may be for you um, and and so that is that is the tough thing is a lot of the time in the fine arts there's a lot more room for subjectivity and that includes subjectivity and how you assess your students um, so I think knowing the right profs who will support you in your journey and understand that, you know, the current situation with medical school admissions is important. Um, and, and also, yeah, the stuff I said before about finding ways to expand your world and, and kind of just growing yourself as a person, which you do in medicine as well. What happens next in your story? I graduated in 2017. Um, so I took an extra year and a half to finish the, the two, um, degrees. And I really actually don't regret that looking back. I think, you know, provided that the financial situation is okay and the other factors are okay and you're not in a rush to graduate, um, mm -hmm. those, for me, I think it was a very good uh, decision. Um, and I gained a lot that I wouldn't have outside of the university at that time. So uh, I finished that and then uh, for a year or I guess nine months, I traveled to France. There was a uh, uh, music program going on there near Paris um, and uh, it was an incredible experience. I learned a great deal from the, the both the performer and the composer mentors there and it was just a great cultural experience too. Um, you know we were in the countryside so you basically can't uh, most people don't speak English very fluently so you, you know you never learn a language like when you have no choice to mm -hmm. um, but to use it. And uh, uh, shortly after that, I was given an uh, opportunity for UBC. Um, and after that, I, I attended the interview and things actually looked pretty good from there. Um, the main difficulty for me in terms of getting into med school was actually the MCAT. And I found that to be a really tough exam. And so the year before I took the MCAT, but my score wasn't, um, wasn't really competitive enough to be able to reach the threshold mm -hmm. for admission. And so I actually tried twice to get into to medical school. The first time was, was when I had trouble with the MCAT. And the second time, which interestingly kind of worked out. You know, so. And 
and that's what led me into, into UBC. I made some plans to travel because I, I knew about this workshop for quite a while. Um, and so I did want to involve myself in it. And it turns out that that was actually a good idea because it was in September. So I wouldn't have that free during medical school because medical school starts in August, you know, late August, early September. And so um, I, I don't really know if I had uh, unlike responsible medical students. I'm not sure I had 100% of a plan mm -hmm. in terms of this, but I did know that at some point this was a thing that I wanted to check off maybe my, my life checklist. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I decided to do that because uh, it was a good year. We, I wasn't certain about where things were going to be with admissions anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then it turns out that, that after that, once I found out I got an, um, an a interview acceptance, mm -hmm. then you know, all the gears were pointed more towards excelling in the interview and getting into medical school that way. I think maybe that's a good takeaway, the fact you didn't have a concrete plan that maybe it will comfort someone out there knowing they don't have to have a very detailed plan of exactly what they'll do in their year off. Um, and they can just kind of go with the flow and see what kind of things they've always wanted to cross, uh, tick off their bucket list. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, it's kind of, you know, prepare for the worst and expect the best kind of scenario. So I did have a plan, but it was sort of multiple years um, in advance, you know, if it really doesn't work the third time that I apply, maybe I can try this avenue and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, either applying abroad or thinking of another career option or that kind of stuff. But you definitely don't have to have everything right away. And in some ways, it's actually not the best idea because you're, you're sort of, there's so many unknowns in life at that point. I think that, that yeah, mm -hmm. the flexibility is, is important. So I guess as we wrap up this section, are there any parting tips or things you we didn't talk about yet up to advise someone who wants to balance an undergrad in something you know biological or more medicine geared and something else? I think that the key thing in terms of the admissions process um, of getting into medicine for that point of it is, I, I still think what got me in, and this is definitely not the same for everybody and uh, uh, it's it's not a be-all end-all advice but the thing that got me in sort of was the fact that I was involved um, with many different uh, activities that I really liked and, and was passionate about and if you're genuinely passionate about something be it a sport or be it um, something medicine related or something artistic related and you pursue it you know really to to the highest level you can and you involve other people in it um, you can't really go wrong doing that. It shows up on, on the application when they ask for you know, various um, things that you enjoy doing and how you spend your time and who you network with when you spend your time. The bottom line is kind of do what you like doing with a mind to what the requirements for medical school are and, uh, and, and pursue it in as far as you can. Thank you so much, Brandon, for taking the time to chat. That was cool. I didn't. I felt like I learned a lot about your journey to medical school. I say thanks a lot also for having me on your channel, and it looks like you're doing some pretty cool stuff. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Subscribe to the channel. Like this video if you liked it. Bye, folks.